Uh, good evening. For those joining the room, just to let you know, we're going to give it a few minutes for people to show up. You are muted. Uh, we will and will remain muted through the presentation, uh, but we'll have uh, time for chat and questions later. So glad to see people arriving. Again, for those that are joining us, uh, your microphone or your microphone is muted, but you should be able to hear. Um, so we'll sit tight and we'll start in a few minutes. I will give it about two more minutes for people to show up and we'll get going. Well, as we wait another minute for uh, everybody to join, I hope that sound of the rain on my metal roof isn't drowning out to other sounds. Coast is living up to its reputation tonight. Well, let's go ahead and start. Good evening and welcome to tonight's program. Uh, the webinar is titled Friends and Fronds, Exploring the Connection Between Birds and Kelp. 
My name is Kent Doty. I am the Coastal Conservation Coordinator for the Audubon Society of Lincoln City, who along with Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition is hosting tonight's program. Next slide. Just a little bit on housekeeping. We're gonna do short introductions. Then the uh, speaker will share with you for about 45 minutes. We will provide time for a question and answer. Um, the chat is disabled, but you can put your questions in the Q&A chat button it should be located on the bottom of your screen. Some people might have it at the top. Just to let everybody know the webinar is being recorded and we'll finish up about 8 p.m. Next. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement statement. Before the period of white settlement, the land and waters that we now occupy along the Oregon coast were home to the Tillamook and Alsi peoples. It is right and just to recognize these sovereign Indian nations and to remember the dispossession they were forced to endure. Despite these losses, Tillamook and Alsi people continue to thrive and act collectively as part of the existing confederations. As we engage with wildlife and the environment that surrounds us today, we pledge to learn from these nations within the Confederated Tribes of Siletz and our neighbors, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Run. We look forward to collaborating on our common goals. A little bit about Lincoln City Audubon. Uh, we've been serving Lincoln and Tillamook County since 2006. Our Core uh, objectives are education, community science, and conservation action. Uh, we hold birding outings and other events each month, uh, events like this. And our conservation focus areas include forest practices, rocky habitats, marine reserves, water quality, and threats to birds and wildlife, all viewed through the lens of climate change. You can find out more about us at lincolncityaudubon.org. And now I'll turn it over to my co-host, Annie. Hi, everyone. My name is Annie Merrill. I'm the Ocean and Estuaries Manager at Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition and also your co-host tonight. Uh, Oregon Shores is a nonprofit whose mission is to engage, educate, and empower people to protect and increase the resilience of the coast ecosystems, landscapes, and communities. We have been watchdogs for the Oregon coast for over 50 years. Uh, protecting public access to the beaches and natural resources that are threatened from irresponsible development. Our geographic focus is the entire Oregon coast from the coast range to the continental shelf. We also have a robust community science program and network of volunteers through our Coast Watch program. We host the educational events like tonight's webinar. We also conduct outreach and provide tools and resources for communities to engage in coastal conservation and advocacy. And you can find us at OregonShores.org. Thanks, Annie. Uh, we're just thrilled to have Roy Lowe with us this evening. Roy's a resident of Walport, Oregon. He was employed with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 37 years and is the project leader for the Oregon Coast National Wildlife Refuge Complex upon his retirement in 2015. Roy has been volunteering with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service since then, the Paulson Institute, and the World Wildlife Fund in Hong Kong. His primary hobby is birding and wildlife photography. And I think we're in for a real treat tonight. As you can see, his photos are just stunning. So with that, uh, we can't hear applause, but give a warm welcome. And remember, you can put your questions as we go along. We'll cover those afterwards in the Q&A button. Thanks. Go Take it away, Roy. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Annie and Kent. Appreciate it. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about birds and kelp. And most of the time when I'm referring to kelp, I'm referring to bull kelp, the, the stuff that grows subtitally that it's 100 to 200 feet tall and forms beds out in the, in the area. But there are 30 species of kelp uh, in the world, and some of them are very short. And for instance, this intertidal uh, sea palm here is a type of kelp. And I'll refer to that a little bit, but mostly I'll be talking about uh, bull kelp. So first I wanna start a little uh, tour of the Oregon coast. And this is Harris, Harris Beach in Brooklyn. 
proteins. And if you look, you'll see all this spotty area down here. This is bull kelp uh, growing in the area. And as you may know, bull kelp has to grow on a hard surface. The holdfast has to attach to a hard surface. It can't grow in sand and other substrates. So it's restricted to these hard bottom areas. Uh, this is Goat Island, uh, a little bit further north than that last photo. And I might say that all the rocks, reefs, and islands on the Oregon coast that are above the surface of the sea and separated from the mainland are part of the National Wildlife Refuge System, Oregon Islands National Wildlife Refuge, and it's also Oregon Islands Wilderness Area, uh, set aside specifically for birds, mammals, and unique uh, vegetation. This is Crook Point, just south of Cape Sebastian. and. We actually, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service actually acquired this headland as well and owns this here. And you can see the beginning to see the kelp beds early in the season here. Here's another view of it looking down on it. Uh, and you can see uh, the kelp beds here. Um, and in the distance, you can see uh, Sebastian at the top of the photo. So that gives you a reference for where we're at. And this is a really nice uh, area for kelp. and Later in the summer, it gets really dense. And this is what it looks like from, from the water. And uh, when sea otters re are reintroduced to Oregon, I, I imagine this will be one of the sites where they're probably, if they're not put here, they'll end up here. It's just a really, really great area uh, for them. A little farther north, this is the Orford Reef. And out here, we have Double Rock, Needle Rock, and this is Pyramid Rock. And you can see the kelp beds here. Uh, and close to the rocks and, and along here. So another great area for, for kelp. This is a close-up of Pyramid Rock, and it's it's tough to see at the south of two, but the kind of brown spots on the rock there are actually stellar sea lions. This is the largest pupping site for stellar sea lions in U.S. waters south of Alaska. And every year we have about 500 pups born there. And it wasn't just a decade ago, I think, is when they we got delisted. It was a threatened species, so it's it's recovering and doing pretty well. This is Humbug Mountain, the south side of Humbug Mountain, just south of Port Orford. And uh, there's some really great kelp beds on the south side of this uh, headland. And you can see this smooth area here. And this is a really dense stand of kelp. And kelp can uh, really take knock down the surface tension of way, uh, wavelets and it can also dampen uh, swells and stuff. So it has a, a mechanism there where it calms the local water. So you can see, you know, it, there's not a, a wind mass blowing through there like the rest of the area. And here you see it uh, from, the, from the water. It's just, it's really amazing to, to see that up close. There's another view, really dense. And back in my younger years when I was in high school and shortly thereafter, I used to do a lot of uh, snorkeling and scuba diving in California. And I've dove under these kelp bed and it's really amazing. It's almost like flying through an old growth forest. You have uh, uh, plants growing down low on the bottom. Then you have these long stipes, these stalks of the kelp, and then this dense canopy. And underneath you see schools of larger fish, lots of juvenile fish. There might be uh, krill-like organisms massing there. And so it's really, you get a really feel for the productivities when you're able to go underneath them and look at the, uh, the wildlife there. This is around the north side of, um, of um, Humbug Mountain. And again, you, you can see the kelp breaking the surface here. Lots of good rocky habitat in this uh, area. And uh, this is uh, Redfish Rocks, and it's also the, uh, the Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve area. It includes these four rocks in a large area. In the background, you see Island Rock. And um, you don't see a whole lot of kelp right here. Uh, the rocks are pretty, pretty well defined. And um, so not big patches here, but I've got an image here that was uh, of the bottom of what the bottom looks like that was uh, mapped by the state. And the, the sort of the brick colored, kind of the dull red color is the hard bottom is rock and boulders where kelp could potentially attach to. And, you see the green col colors here. This is island rock, and this is the redfish rocks here. So that's the potential area for kelp to grow. Um, this area and many areas uh, were hit hard when the uh, we had this mass die of, of sea stars, or what people call starfish. And that's a primary predator of 
sea urchins. And when sea urchins no longer had predation by them, they, they really expanded. And we have areas now that are devoid of kelp. It's been eaten and destroyed by, by these urchins. So we have these, what they call urchin barrens, where these uh, urchins have just really kind of obliterated the habitat. So really, really hoping that the sea stars can make a comeback and we can get some more, um, some more predation on these populations and get, get some kelp back in areas where it's been a loss. And I know in the Port Orford areas, there's been some pretty serious loss. This is the Orford Reef. It's the furthest offshore that we have any rocks and islands in Oregon. It's about four miles offshore from Port Orford. Uh, the rocks in the uh, near area here are the uh, Orford Reef, and then the Blanco Reef is right here, and then uh, Cape Blanco, of course. Uh, lots of kelp around these, these reef areas. And this is along the north side. Uh, you can see the dense kelp beds around this uh, around these rocks. This group of rocks is called Gull Rock, and ironically, there are three official Gull Rocks on the Oregon coast. Uh, so this is Gull Rock number one on the south. And if you look closely at the tops of those rocks, you'll see it looks like kind of salt and pepper black. And those are seabird colonies. Those are common murre colonies. And there's I forget the exact exact number, that, but there's over twenty thousand common murres breeding on this, this complex of rocks. Now we've uh, moved up to uh, Cape Arago, and in the background over here, you can see Coos Bay. And this is the, the Simpson Reef right here, and you'll get another look at it from a different angle. And you can see the, the extensive kelp beds that are located here. Um, this is Sand Island here, and uh, all of these, this island and all the surrounding rocks is a huge haul outside for um, marine mammals, for pinnipeds, seals, and sea lions. And I think Peak numbers recorded by the state are over 7,000 animals here at the time. And it includes uh, harbor seals, that pup here. We actually have a few pups of northern elephant seals that are born here. And then a major haul out for stellar sea lions and California sea lions. And uh, I was lucky in 1993, I was down here working with a TV crew. And right off of the edge of Sand Island here, we saw a sea otter, and uh, it was obviously an otter that had wandered down from uh, Washington State. But um, this would this will probably be a prime area for reintroduction of sea otters with these dense kelp beds here in Wassa Forge. Now we've jumped jumped up to the central coast, and this is Cape Foulweather, and you can see the kelp beds just offshore here from. Um, from the, uh, the gift shop here. This is one of the better kelp areas in Lincoln County is along the stretch here. Uh, and of course, we have the Otter Rock Marine Reserve here that uh, includes this part of the shoreline and, uh, and offshore. And then further north uh, in Tillamook County is um, Cape Lookout. And along the south side, it's a little bit tough to see with this photo, but these are all kelp beds that are, are established in here. And it's more sandy on the on the north side, so we don't really have any kelp beds on that side. But um, and this is uh, three arch rocks. Uh, now earlier I said that all the rocks reefs and islands were part of Oregon Islands, and that wasn't totally true. These group of rocks here are a separate refuge. It's called Three Arch Rocks National Wildlife Refuge, and um, it was established in 1907. It was the first refuge established west of the Mississippi River. And we owe a, a debt of gratitude to William L. Finley, who documented the wildlife here and the destruction of the wildlife at the time. Uh, but in the foreground here, you'll see these, these kelp beds uh, growing in the, in the water here. So really nice beds right next to, uh, to this area. And then uh, jumping up to the far north coast in Oregon, this is Ecola Point and lots of rocks in this area, rocky bottom kelp, kelp force. And then you get around a corner and Tillamook Head's not too far away, a mile away or so. And then from there north up to the Columbia River is all sandy habitat. So no more no more kelp in that area. And in fact, about half, the southern half of the Washington coast is all sand. So you don't get back to any kelp habitat until you get way up to Point Grenville north of Grace Harbor. Okay, some of the birds, um, some of the birds we have, like these are common murres, um, are strictly marine birds. They, they're only found in the ocean. They will come into the estuaries to, in small numbers to forage and stuff, but they're always found in the marine environment. 
as to po opposed to other birds like these larger birds in this photograph are black-bellied plovers. And uh, we find them along our coastal beaches foraging. We find them in estuaries foraging. You can find them in the Willamette Valley and they've been sighted in every state across the, the country. So they use a variety of habitats, not just a marine environment. And these are obviously long distance migrators. Uh, some of these birds are going from the Arctic to, uh, to South America. Some of the birds we see uh, using uh, kelp beds uh, are cormorants, particularly the plot cormorant. And if you see these cormorants from a distance, they, they obviously look black and you don't see these beautiful iridescent colors unless you get close enough and you're in the right uh, light. But you can see this is really astounding looking. And in fact, when John James Audubon made it to the Oregon coast, he described this bird and he called it the violet green cormorant, which I think is a, a better name than pelagic cormorant. And also in the breeding season, they get this bright kind of uh, orange red uh, face, uh, the tissue turns bright colored like this. And here it is, you see the iridescence, I'm up pretty close to it, it's forging in the, in the bay. And you'll note on the left there, there's a white flank patch and it has it on each side. And so we have three species of cormorants along the Oregon coast and this one, in the, in the breeding season, so roughly from now and through the late summer, these white flank patches. So if you see a cormorant and it has white flank patches, you know it's a plagiar cormorant. It's a really easy way to separate them from the other species, even if you're not a birder of any kind. So a lot of my pictures of birds and, uh, and kelp beds are at a great distance. We don't have kelp beds right close to shore. So some of this you'll have to take with a grain of salt and, and believe what I tell you. But what I, this is Devil's, um, Devil's Punch Bowl near Otter Rock. And I wanna concentrate on this little area here amongst the kelp. And as I was up there watching this plagic cormorant seen right here in the middle, was diving and foraging here. And I thought, okay, well, it'll dive underneath the kelp and it'll come out to the right and it'll go somewhere else. And it repeatedly dove in the same place time after time after time, which told me it was on food there, probably a school of something. And it just kept foraging in this one location. That, to me, it describes it just how valuable this habitat can be to birds at various times. And a little bit further to the left of that site, there was a mixed flock of branch cormorants and pelagic cormorants actively diving and foraging in the, the kelp forest here. Uh, this is a pelagic cormorant and all three species of cormorants regurgitate food directly into the mouth of their young. So cormorants go out and they'll catch three, four, five, six, depending on the fish, on the size of the fish. They'll catch those, swallow those, come back to nests and then regurgitate directly to the, to the young. And so we can't really tell what they're eating when they do this because the food's going from one mouth to the other and there's not much uh, chance to see what they're eating. But if you're out where they're foraging, if you're quick, you can, you can see what they're eating or take a photo and try to figure out later. Usually when they come up, they'll try to swallow that fish as fast as possible because the goal will be on them trying to steal the fish from them. So you don't have a whole lot of time. And this, this cormorant, this pledged cormorant has a cabazon, and that's a species of fish we'd expect to find in kelp beds. They, they live on rocky substrates, so that would be a species you would see in a, a kelp bed. And this, uh, this cormorant has a shaghorn sculpin, and it's doing everything it can to try to resist being eaten, and uh, it lost the battle. And to surprise of some people, cormorants do feed on crabs. And this is a, a small, young uh, Dungeness crab. And those legs would be dangerous to swallow. So they, they take all the legs off the crab before they consume it. And they do that by just slinging it around and pulling the legs off. And here you see, it's just about got the last leg off. And um, then, um, then it swallows it. And if you look closely here, this is the carapace of the crab going down. And it, it, to me, that just hurts. I, that's a pretty big thing to swallow in that hard shell. And then, you know, they digest that thing. This is a branch cormorant. Uh, it's, a, it's a larger cormorant uh, and it nests all along the Oregon coast uh, on the outer coast. Uh, in a few estuaries, it also, there's some colonies, particularly the Columbia River. And during the breeding season, they get these white plumes on their back and the side of their face. And that gular skin below their lower bill gets almost like a fluorescent kind of aqua blue color. 
And if you look closely, you can see there's green air resistance to this bird. So they're actually, they're actually quite beautiful. They uh, lose these feathers, these uh, plumes in the uh, non-breeding season and the color on their gular area fades dramatically. And this is a group of branch cormorants and they, they kind of set up a root, root, nest like the males do, and then they try to attract females. So the first thing they do when they're showing off is they'll bend over and be squawking and then they'll throw their head back and flap their wings. And somehow this is supposed to entice a female to, to join them. And so here you see a bunch of males displaying and here's a couple that has already gotten uh, together and they're, they'll start nest building now. And uh, many cormorants, particularly branch cormorants, will, will get vegetation from the mainland. They'll land on slopes and stuff and pull up grass and stuff, but they also make good use of kelp and seaweed. So here we have now kelp starting to be a structural thing for, for birds. And you'll see them carrying this stuff back to the colony to build their nest. And a lot of times I'm out birding or taking photographs and I'll have people go, oh, look, that cormorant has a crab. And reality, usually it's a big hunk of kelp or, or seagrass. And here you see them flying back to, to do this nest building. And this is a, there's a site where there's some kelp within maybe 150 feet of their, of their breeding colony. And in this case, he's got so much vegetation, he can't get airborne. So he's actually swimming and dragging it back to the, to the rock to uh, build a nest. And they'll keep building even after the female, uh, after the, both birds begin incubating the eggs, they'll, they'll build for a while longer than, than, uh, than that ends for the, for the season. But and this kind of interesting picture, this is another regurgitation going on. Now that's a very large young. And before these young fledge, some of them may attain the weight of adult or even more than adult. They're, they just really stuff down the food. In fact, here you see the entire head is buried inside the mouth of this adult. And if you look at this little point right here, this is the bill of the young poking out the back of the neck. So, uh, Pretty dedicated parent to, to go through all that. So this is another species we find associated with um, kelp beds. This are, these are pigeon guillemots and they're very gregarious birds. You often see them sitting in flocks near uh, nesting sites. Uh, in the winter time, uh, in the summer, uh, during breeding season, they're mostly black with these white wing patches, but during the winter, there's more white than black. So they, they really look different in the winter time and they generally stay further offshore. We don't see them a lot in the winter time. In the summertime, they also get these bright red legs and the mouth lining really brightens up during the, during the breeding season. So these two are singing to each other. And this is uh, a male kind of strutting his stuff, stuff for his, uh, his, his female. And uh, a lot of uh, pigeon guillemots nest in uh, cracks and crevices in rocks. And they do this to avoid predation of their eggs and young by gulls. So here we have an adult sitting at the entrance to its the nest. And this is a young tucked back in here. And this is almost like an apartment complex because we have a plagiac cormorant nesting right above uh, the pigeon guillemot. But uh, guillemots nest in a variety of habitats, uh, particularly human habitats, like around Yukuna Bay, they they nest under wharfs and piers and in ship bumpers and nest boxes. I've seen them in drainage pipes. So they, uh, they will make use of any dark area they can get to. This is a, a sort of a typical cliff site. These birds are uh, roosting here and the nest site's over in this crack and crevice. And you have to have a lot of dexterity to come and go to that site. This bird, uh, the nest is back where its bill is, back in a, uh, a little uh, crevice in there. And the, they have uh, one to two young. Uh, so, And about 35 years ago, we discovered they were nesting along sandy beaches in Oregon, which really surprised us. And they were making use of the really dense sand just below the vegetation line and they dig these burrows uh, back in the sand. And so if you're walking along a beach, you might actually see um, birds flying across a beach and they kind of disappear up by the vegetation. They're going into these burrows. So uh, this is again, Cape foul weather and you can see the kelp bed here. This is a pretty major site for uh, pigeon guillemots. We've recorded 153 individuals 
uh, nesting here. We don't know their, we, we can't count the nest sites. We see them coming and going, but so our count is about 153 uh, pigeon gill moths. That's one of the larger sites in Oregon. And they're nesting in rock rubble at the base of the cliff here and over in this area. And I think in this area here, uh, it's also the largest breeding site for plagic cormorants in Oregon with about 475 nests recorded on these cliffs. And you can see the the whitewash from the, from the birds here. So important area right on the edge of the uh, marine reserve. So with pigeon guillemots, they capture a single fish. And if you can catch them going to and from their burrow, you can get an idea what they're eating. And this is a, a bird with a shaghorn sculpin. Uh, this is a bird with a flatfish, perhaps an English sole. I'm not really exactly sure. And then this one has a Pacific sand lance, which is an extremely valuable forage fish uh, all along the Pacific coast. And what I found with birds that I'm monitoring at certain sites is once they found a food source, they kept exploiting it. So this individual bird kept coming back with sand lance. The last one, you know, kept coming back with flatfish. So once they find a source, they really work it pretty heavily because they've got very ravenous young up there in those burrows that are growing rapidly. Oh, and this one has a, a species of rockfish, which we'd expect them to find around uh, kelp beds. I guess uh, something I should point out here is um, the wildlife I'm speaking about, the birds, uh, we don't have a species of bird that's absolutely dependent on kelp beds. Like for instance, a marble murrelet is absolutely dependent on old growth forest for nesting. But these birds exploit a, a variety of habitats and their, foods, their food supply comes and goes. And so they need various habits, uh, habitats to make a go of it. And the common mur is, is one of those. Uh, they nest in really dense colonies. They lay a single egg and they, they attempt to incubate that uh, egg between the, their web of their feet and their breast. And uh, hopefully if they're, they're successful, they'll get one chick out to sea. And uh, they come and go to the colony, uh, capturing a single fish and flying back with it in their, uh, in, in their bill. And they always have the head in the throat area and the tail sticking out. And there's been a lot of research done by uh, Oregon State University at Yaquina Head monitoring seabirds there. And they could estimate the size of the fish because they know the average size, uh, average length of the bill. And they're really good they, at doing photography and identifying this, the species of fish they're feeding on. A lot of times they can only get it to the, uh, a classification of smelt or rockfish, but sometimes they could actually nail it right down to the species. So that gives us a good feeling for what's going on in the marine environment and by them monitoring uh, what type of fish are being brought into the colony. And uh, a lot of times, if you watch these flocks that are returning to the colony, you'll see every one of them is coming back with this little tail dangling out the front of their mouth. They're, they've all got uh, a fish that they're bringing back to, uh, to feed their young. And here's a close up of an adult reaching down to give a, ch a little young chick a silver perch, a, a perch we'd expect to see around kelp beds. And MERS have a little bit different way of raising their chicks. When they're three weeks old, they leave the colony with their dad and the mom's done with parental care and she, she leaves the area. And here you see a little chick jumping off down here, uh, right in this area. And they have little tiny stubby wings. They're mostly downy birds. And sometimes they bounce and roll on the rocks and they mostly usually make it to the water. It's pretty amazing, but they're really small. and then they go to sea with their dad and the dad can no longer fly long distances to, to get to adequate food. And so they've got to, they've got to swim and then find adequate food. And I think it's conditions like this when the, when the food supply is really difficult nearby that kelp beds can be the difference in these young birds surviving. We oftentimes have really heavy mortality of these chicks during the first several months they're at sea uh, being raised by their dad and then trying to make a living of their own. And so I think, uh, it would be really important for some of these younger younger birds to have food supply that uh, you would find in a kelp bed. And here you can see this chick is getting quite larger. So the, the male goes through a molt and he's flightless also during the summer when the chick is flightless. So 
Uh, they can swim great distances, but uh, again, it's, uh, you know what the marine environment's like, it's pretty tough out there. So when I initially was preparing this talk, I thought, well, what about rhinoceros auklets? You know, they nest in burrows and rocks and islands and a few really inaccessible headlines. I thought, well, you know, it's really a plastic bird, but we do see them sitting along the coastline often. And in fact, this pair is doing a, a, a courtship display about 300 yards off of Yaquin ahead. So I was really amazed that they were present there doing this. And then it wasn't a week later that I was at Devil's Punch Bowl and there was a juvenile rhinoceros auklet actively, actively foraging among the kelp here. And this is a bird here. And I know it's tough to see, but you'll have to trust me that indeed it is a, uh, a juvenile uh, rhinoceros auklet. So there's another proof that you know, birds that are either stressed or very inexperienced might be able to make a go of it by finding food in, in kelp beds. So marble murrelet, that's the bird that breeds inland and old growth forest. Uh, during the summertime, murrelets are located right close to shore. They spend most of their time within a mile and a quarter of the shoreline. And oftentimes they're concentrated right behind the waves, really close in. And so I, Myself have not seen them in kelp beds, but I could very well envision seeing them there. And I would bet that perhaps young that leave the inland colonies on their own, come to the coast and try to figure out what to do, could end up in kelp beds and find sustenance there. So um, that's one we need to be looking more into, at least uh, maybe some people have the information that I'm just not aware of. But. And then we have uh, grebes that use kelp beds. and. I, Again, another long distance shot, shot. This is a redneck grebe in winter plumage. And here's a close up of what it looks like uh, during the winter time. No red neck there, uh, obviously, but in the summertime, uh, this is what they what they look like when they leave our area to go nest inland. Again, this is a redneck grebe. And we can also expect to see horn grebes, uh, a smaller bird than previously really bright eye. Now, these guys make a really dramatic change when they uh, put their good clothes on in the summertime. This is what they look like during the summer. Pretty radical change. Uh, so, um, and where we have concentration of birds, uh, we have uh, predatory birds. This is a juvenile eagle cruising over a, a kelp bed. Juvenile bald eagle, excuse me. We rarely see golden eagles on the Oregon coast. And of course, this is uh, an adult bird. They get their adult plumage in four or five years of, of age. And uh, I know birds really well. And you see those legs kind of sticking out the back of the bird that uh, is being carried by this eagle. They've got these big lobes. And I can tell by the size of the head and bill that this is a horned grebe that this eagle has just uh, picked off and is going to, going to consume. I wish I would have seen it earlier when it was passing me, but um, nonetheless, uh, able to identify this bird. So we have a couple of larger grebes as well that uh, are commonly found in and around kelp beds. And this is a Western grebe. And you can tell it's a Western grebe because that red eye is located in the black feathers of its head. And its bill is more of a dull yellowish to almost greenish color. And it's dark along the top and bottom of the bill. Now, I wanted to show you how far back the, uh, the legs are on these birds. They're really pretty incredible that uh, they're great for swimming, diving, but these birds almost can't walk at land. They have to stand totally vertical and waddle around. They're, they're pretty, uh, pretty well not uh, built for that. So when they nest, they nest on floating nests or right next to shore. Again, look at the color of that bill and notice that the red eye is in the black because this next photo will show a Clark scream. Now, here's a Clark scream. You can see that that eye is in the white um, on the bird. And notice how that bill is kind of a bright yellow to almost going to an orange color. And here's uh, both of them. The bottom one is a Western Grebe. Top one is a Clark's Grebe. And you can see the difference where that eye is located in the bill color. And also notice on the um, Clark's Grebe, we've got a lot more light feathers run up on the, the back of the bird. So. Um, most people, you know, if they're not birders, would think they're all one species, but um, we see more, way more Western grebes here than we do Clark's grebes. And then we have three species of loons that we might see in kelp beds, and one of those is a common loon. This is a winter plumage bird. It's the largest of our loons. 
And this is one that's in breeding, breeding plumage. We don't get to see a lot of this. They pretty much leave the area when they're in the process of molting. So, um, and these breed, these birds breed all across the continent and uh, on lakes and so forth. So uh, they eat a variety of fish. This happens to be a rather large uh, starry flounder that this bird is gonna swallow. And it kind of had to squeeze it. And it's pretty interesting to watch this process. But they also uh, will eat crabs. I've seen a lot of them feeding on crabs. And again, they'll they'll pull those legs off, even on these small crabs, just because uh, those, those legs would uh, do damage to the throat and so forth. And again, it's important to have a variety of productive habitats for loons, including kelp beds, because at times they get stuck at places. Now, here's a, here's a loon that's looking good. It's stretching, note the wing feathers. But at this time of the year, some of the common loons go through catastrophic wing molt and they lose all their flight feathers. So this bird, you can see the feathers are just starting, the, uh, the primary feathers are just starting to erupt. This bird is flightless, so it's stuck wherever it's at. And it, you know, it needs to be in a place where there's uh, ad adequate food supply. And brown pelicans do not breed in Oregon, but we get large numbers coming up here. They breed during the winter and early spring in Southern California, Mexico. And they come up and they use a variety of habitats. You've seen them in estuaries and all along the coast, but we've also seen them foraging among and around uh, kelp beds. This was once a threatened species that's fully recovered now. And then gulls are uh, another species that make use of kelp beds. This is a Western gull uh, from a distance, of course. And some of the gulls we would see are Western gull, Glaucus wing gull, ring-billed, California, and the short-billed gull up until about a year or two ago was known as the mew gull. So some people know that as a mew gull. So those are five species we, we could see using kelp beds. And there are other species. One of the things that little, is a little complicating on the central and north coast of Oregon is these two species on top, western gull and glaucus ring gull, freely hybridized. And a great percentage of the birds uh, from Lincoln County North are a mixture of both of these species. So western gull, we're at the sort of the north end of its breeding light range. And for glaucus ring gulls, we're kind of at the south end. And like I said, they freely hybridize. So they can be really difficult to separate by species. And then one of my favorite species of waterfowl, uh, classified as a sea duck, are harlequin ducks. And we only find these along the coast in rocky, rocky habitat, uh, kelp beds. Uh, we, you know, they don't use sandy areas for the most part. Um, Whenever I see a male hardwood duck, I can't help myself. I have to photograph it. I probably have a thousand photographs, but uh, they're just really attractive birds. The other thing I really like about these birds is during the, during the wintertime, they're using these uh, coastal areas where rocks and, uh, rocks and reefs and so forth. In the summertime, when they breed, they're going to high mountain, fast flowing streams to breed. So we have a small breeding population in the Cascades, a much larger breeding population in the Rocky Mountains and to the north in Canada and Alaska. So they use uniquely different habitats uh, during the year. And this, this bird, I thought, wow, it's actually eating this uh, marine algae. And I watched it closely and what it was actually doing, it was gleaning invertebrates off the leaves of this uh, algae. It wasn't actually eating the algae. But I, I told you they go up to the mountains where they, uh, where they nest. And once the female, once the a clutch is complete and the female starts uh, incubating, the males totally bend the females and come back to the coast. Uh, and when they come back to the coast, they go through this molting process that all waterfowl do. And there, you can see these are all males. They don't all look like it, but they're rapidly, rapidly fading. So uh, they're gonna go through a catastrophic wing molt as well and become flightless for four weeks or more. And so it's important for them to be in areas like this where there's kelp beds, seagrass, sea and adequate food where they feed around rocks and islands. And again, you can see they're starting, they're looking pretty ratty here. And while I, while I was watching these birds, there were just feathers flying everywhere uh, as they uh, changed, uh, changed their dress. And eventually they end up looking almost like a female. This is a male duck in complete uh, eclipse plumage. And uh, it has, um, it is flightless at this point. The easiest way to tell this is not a female is these white secondary feathers on the wings. The females do not have these, but 
Otherwise, it would fool you if you didn't really know. And so uh, we see uh, great blue herons that specialize some birds in rocky intertidal areas and uh, uh, in intertidal kelp beds. This is a bird I see commonly foraging at uh, seal rock. There's uh, birds also at otter rock, uh, you clean ahead. And then we have species of shorebirds that are only found in rocky intertidal areas that forage in these areas at low tide. And this is a, a surf bird that breeds uh, in the subarctic and arctic and winters along our, our coastline. So these are classified as shorebirds, but these birds spend a good deal of their life out to sea. These are phalaropes. These are redneck phalaropes. And these birds breed along the coastline of uh, the Arctic Ocean and winter offshore from uh, in South America, well offshore. So um, pretty amazing feat that these birds do. This is a winter plumaged bird. And this one is a breeding season plumage. You can see the red on the neck and gray. They get looking pretty good. They, they kind of have reverse roles. The female it's, it has a more beautiful plumage than the male, and the male takes care, the male incubates the eggs and raises the young, female doesn't participate, so totally different from many other species of birds. And I showed this, this is a young of the year that has just arrived on the Oregon coast, and I want you to look at its toes there. You can see they have big lobes on them, very different from most shorebirds, and that's because these birds spend most of their, at least all their winter time, uh, far out to sea swimming. So a uh, little bit different feature on these guys. Uh, this is a red phalarope, very similar to the last species. Uh, this is winter plumage and quite dramatic difference in the summer. This is their breeding plumage. And um, now kelp has, begins to break away from its hold fast and it's drifting at sea. And oftentimes there's a uh, food that, that drifts in around these uh, floating masses. And this is a red fowler opening, primarily feeding on uh, plankton. And I watched it as it circled around and fed all around this, this floating mass here. Oops, sorry. Uh, these are uh, redneck fowler ropes. And this photo was taken 5.5 miles west of Newport. And this is one long stipe of bull kelp floating. And these, these phalaropes kept circling and circling, foraging just around this one, uh, one piece of kelp. And so obviously plankton was concentrating there for some reason. I don't really know why, but I suspect it could be a couple of things. Could be that the, the kelp changes enough current that, that uh, zooplankton kind of concentrate, whether they want to or not around it. And it may be that the plankton is actually selecting to be near this, this piece of kelp for cover. But regardless, we watched these birds. They kept circling and circling, feeding here. And, and so, um, so here it's, it's now left where it grew and it's still providing a uh, function for birds. And then of course it ends up, a lot of it ends up on our beaches and literally talking tons and tons of it. And uh, when it arrives, it often has various invertebrates on it that birds feed on. And then uh, uh, invertebrates on the beach will concentrate around it and under it, uh, providing more food for birds. And it, it gets, you know, put up on the beach here and it begins to decay. And, you know, beach sands are pretty much devoid of nutrients, pretty nutrient poor areas. So here you have this kelp breaking down, putting nutrients into this environment that, you know, benefits invertebrates. And it also is transported up high on the beach where we have uh, uh, beach plants growing on the high beach and low foredune. So it almost acts like a fertilizer, if you will. And this is a little bit tough to see, but these are all tracks along this stipe of bull kelp where a bird was feeding. And I, I looked at it on site and I could tell it was a wimbrel. And then later, oh, I'll talk about that later. Um, I wanted to play a video for you here, but my internet connection here at my house is so poor the video won't play. So this is a still shot. This is the, the cane piece of sea palm. And all those little holes you see are little burrows of, of uh, beach hoppers. And you can see a beach hopper in the upper right. It's a little amphipod. Some people call them sea fleas or beach fleas. And they concentrate around kelp and, and thus provide 
food for birds. And so in my video, I have a little garden tool where I just start to lift this up and all of a sudden these, there's 20, 30, 35 springing all around. It just shows you how dense they are around these. So next fall, when the, when the kelp's washing the shore, if you're on the beach, just move some of the stuff and it'll blow you away on how many invertebrates are, are harbored under here. And here's a, a, it was a different day. This is another piece of uh, sea palm kelp and this uh, wimbrel is actively feeding around there, probably gobbling up these, these uh, beach hoppers. And uh, I watched these short bill bill dowagers. They're working a much further decayed uh, sea palm and they were to actively feeding around here and then they started to move away. And then two of them were, were drawn right back to it and they stayed just feeding around this. So uh, it was evident that there was really good food supply here for these birds. And, you know, we any just about any bird you see on the beach, you'll eventually see foraging around kelp. And this is a, a Western sandpiper. Uh, kelp on the beach also provides uh, some structural protection. This is a Western snowy plover, a threatened species that in the early 90s, there were somewhere between 35 and 50 left on the entire Oregon coast, and now we're up over 600 or so. Uh, they use kelp to break up their silhouette to kind of hide a little bit from predatory birds. So they're using it to break up their form and catch a little, little shut eye. And, you know, we continually have predatory birds work in the beach. Um, things like peregrine falcons. This, I watch this bird chasing shorebirds on the beach. This is a young of the year peregrine. And, uh, this is a, a merlin that was right by some snowy plovers I was photographing. And you can see there's blood on its belly so it, it had re uh, eaten recently so so here we have kelp on the beach and it's it's feeding it's helping feeding birds it's providing nutrients and it's providing uh some protection for uh some camouflage for for birds and uh and again many birds will use it for this camouflage type of activity this there's three semi-palmated plovers in the middle here and then on either end there's a juvenile um, western sandpipers so um i think that concludes my talk so i will i will share the share the screen back to you annie great thank you so much roy that was awesome beautiful photography thank you all right Okay, so we're gonna do Q&A now. So if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat, but you can also uh, raise your hand if you would like, and you can ask the question verbally. And so we do have one question to get us started here. Uh, Sally wants to know, considering the size of some of the fish, do birds jaws un unhinge like snakes? Uh, no, they don't unhinge. They, they can they can obviously stretch really really greatly, but they don't unhinge. And uh, you, I, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, gulls, but you'll see gulls with sea stars sticking out of their mouth, and they basically can't get it down. They have to wait till they slowly digest one leg off, and then the other, and then they'll make these gargantuan swallows. But um, now I said they don't hinge, but you've shown a picture of a puffin there, and a puffin's bill does it, it does kind of raise up so puffins can carry five six seven fish in their bill at once instead of coming to an apex it's it's like u-shape you can see that soft tissue so it can, its whole bill can go up and down but it's not un, unhinging the jaw yes to answer the next question uh the recording of this talk uh will be sent out later um, excuse me, sorry, I, um, here, one sec, lost the presentation for a second. All right, next question. So Kara wants to know, can you repeat, repeat where you've seen pigeon guillemots nesting on sandy cliffs? Uh, there, I've seen them south of Seal Rock. I've seen them, uh, south of Walport, uh, between Walport and Seal Rock. Um, down near Otter Point on the south coast. Um, there's quite a few different areas. Um, 
and oftentimes we see people climbing on the cliffs and stuff and they don't realize they're potentially disturbing birds because the bird won't return to its burrow if people are standing at the base of it you know so it's kind of a an issue so you know i don't talk a whole lot about where these sites are but um it's it's it, if, you, if it's the summertime and you see birds swimming just off the sandy beach then that means there's a there's burrows next ne uh, nearby so thanks roy mm -hmm. next question is from martha can you explain the bull kelp life cycle are they truly annual so they die off yearly yeah, they really are annuals, and uh, they produce spores that fall and drift and um, start new plants. They have a hold fast that attaches them to the rock, and so, so like cobble won't won't work because it's too light. That the, the plant would just pull the cobble and it would drift away. So it has to be either boulders or solid rock, and it can grow up to ten to twelve inches a day. It's a really rapid grower, which is amazing. And um, but yeah, annual plants, pretty pretty cool. Great. Uh, next question is from Nancy. Do the bright orange feet of the pigeon guillemot serve a function? Uh, you know, I don't know what that is, but I, I assume it has to do with breeding, but both male and female have it. So um, I don't, yeah, it probably has a, a function in terms of attraction, but I don't really know what that is. Same with the mouth lining. Absolutely. Form tends to follow function. So yeah. I'm sure there's a reason. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they know it, but they just won't tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. All right, Debbie wants to know, do you see more healthy bird populations in the marine reserves versus the rest of the coast? I love that question. Yeah, you know, the um, the birds are so, so transitory that it would be hard to, you know, people like would like to say, if we don't have this marine reserve, we're going to lose these birds and stuff. But, you know, this is one of many habitats they use. And MERS can fly up to 60 miles from their colony to, to gather one fish for their young. So undoubtedly, marine, ver, uh, marine reserves benefit birds. But to, to show it would be very difficult because the birds move all around different times of the year, you know. Um, so... Uh, but having that, like I said, having that habitat there when uh, birds are in real trouble uh, and need food supply is really important. Great answer. So next question is from Ingrid. Do all or most birds return to the same nesting sites year after year? Um, yes, the seabirds we're talking about pretty much do and they'll, they'll inhabit the same rock or island uh, and that's been shown at places where they've done long-term studies and they've banded birds and some places they put little geolocators on the bird it's a little tag they put on its leg and it records daylight during the year and if you know when sunrise and sunset is and you know the time you know what latitude you're at and if you know the mid midpoint midpoint between uh, sunset and sunrise, you can t determine longitude. So these birds will go out and it'll be recording all year. And then they're able to capture the birds because they go back to the same exact site and they can remove these geolocators and then put them in the computer and do all this great magic. And it shows you where the bird's been. And um, so, yeah, they, m many of the birds come back to the same site. If, you know, if, if for some reason it's unacceptable, like many sites now we have bald eagles that are causing huge disruption at colonies and some birds are moving to new sites, but uh, and cormorants can shift around some, but most birds are going to go back to the same, sometimes the very same crevice in the rock. Great. So next question is from Jackie. There were lots of dead birds on, on the beach this winter, especially south of Waldport. Can you say anything about this? Yeah, we had one of the largest die-offs that I've seen in my 35 years on the Oregon coast of Casson's Auklets. It's a small... Um, a small seabird, low, low numbers breed along the Oregon coast, but we get a lot of birds down here from British Columbia and Alaska. And, you know, I, I heard one count of 72 dead birds per mile of beach. And it, it stretched from, that I know of, from Tillamook County down past Bandon. So it was a major die off and not all the birds that die come to shore. And um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service sent birds into the National Wildlife Health Lab for diagnosis. One of the fears was avian influenza, which 
I, I thought from the beginning it that would be the case because these birds don't uh, congregate at sea and it only infected one species of birds. And as it turned out, there was no, the only thing they found was it looked like these birds had starved. They, was, they were emaciated, no fat. And we've seen die-offs that cast in zoglets at various other years, just to not to this degree, but you know, we had some really tremendous ocean conditions. And if you can't get an adequate food supply and you're, you're night and day fighting the weather and stuff, uh, particularly younger birds, they just don't make it. Right, let's see. Great answer. Have the urchin barons had a measurable impact on seabird populations? And that question's from Bill. That would, that would be a tough one. Again, a tough one to determine because birds use such geographically different areas, you know, and you'd have to be able to, if a bird only fed at one site, you might be able to make some determination, but these birds will feed at various sites and various locations. So it would be difficult to assign that to anything. But, you know, a lot of people are excited about maybe getting sea otters back in Oregon, Oregon and sea otters eat, eat urchins. But when, when an urchin baron is created, these, these uh, urchins become zombies. They basically go into like a hibernation. They just sit there and they can persist for years without feeding until a piece of kelp floats along. And from what I understand, otters will not eat those urchins because there's no nutritional value value to them. So we really need to get the, the sea star population back. And I know there's a lot of research going on and it looks like there's some glimmer of hope, but man, it was really devastating to lose those sea stars. Absolutely. Yeah, it looks like sunflower sea stars are slowly making a comeback. Um, there've been quite a few documented this past year, but prior to that, uh, there were very few, so. Some number of hope, that's for sure. <laughs> um, how are the black oyster catcher populations impacted by the kelp? Asked Debbie. Um, you know, they they feed in the rocky inner tidal. They're feeding on a lot on mussels and crabs and stuff. So they're not directly they're not directly feeding on species of invertebrates you'd find around kelp. Well, they they eat limpets and things like that. So. Um, so they're really higher in the intertidal areas. So I don't think there's as much of impact uh, associated with with kelp and black oyster catchers. Oyster catchers are, you know, they're not they they have a lot of issues. Uh, you know, we don't have a huge population in Oregon, and uh, so we, we're trying to be very protective. And of course, uh, uh, Portland uh, Bird Alliance, I mean, the Oregon Bird Alliance is monitoring uh, black uh, oyster catchers up and down the coast to try to get a handle on the population and where it's going. Thanks, Roy. Next, Dawn wants to know, is it possible to have a bounty on the sea urchins until the sea stars repopulate? Um, I mean, technically it would be possible, but I don't know who would who would pay it and if it would do any good. I, I remember when I was a diver back in high school days, they, they had a big program where they went down uh, in the Channel Islands and they were smashing sea urchins and it, it appeared to have almost no effect that they they came right back so um with you know i guess if you went down and smashed the sea urchin you'd have to keep going back and keep going back and you know it's labor intensive and whether it work or not is, is questionable so yeah definitely that one seems to be a manner of scale yeah it definitely all right does anybody else have any questions for roy All right, Juno wants to know, for the crab-eating birds, how do they relate to the green crabs? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, you know, I've been looking for, I've been waiting for a common loon or a karma at the surface with the green crab, and so far I haven't captured a photo of that. But uh, I was watching some dredging being done in Alsea Bay a few years ago, and I did see uh, short bill gulls with green crabs that were being pumped up with the with the slurry and so they were feeding on them so birds will definitely feed on them if they can if they're they're present i just haven't been able to capture that yet and it sounds like there's no shortage of green crabs out there anymore so yeah i also think there's uh been some recent research done uh showing that sea otters might help the problem the green crab problem that's true they eat crabs yeah mm -hmm.
All right, any questions? Feel free to raise your hand as well if you wanna speak. Nancy says, great information and incredible pictures. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, Don wants to know, when will the sea otters be reintroduced? I wish it was tomorrow. <laughs> I, you know, they're, they're going through a methodical process. They're talking with all the user groups, commercial fishermen, recreational. Um, and um, I, I don't know when that's going to occur, but I hope, hope hopefully sooner uh, than later. Uh, they were here, you know, historically and were extirpated and th there'll be a big boost to the um, to the ecology of the area, you know, and we I think it was two, November of 2021, we had a single animal show up at Yaquina Head and oh my gosh, the people were flocking there from all over the place to see this one sea otter and I, I was thinking about the economical impact of being able to view sea otters here, you know, to not just whale watching trips, but sea otter trips. And so there's a whole economy there. And I met one guy that he was driving down Interstate 5, he's from out of state, and he saw something on the internet about this sea otter, and he drove all the way over just to see this, this one sea otter. So um, I, I, we can't say for sure, but hopefully it's in my lifetime, and, and the sooner the better. Agreed. Don wants to know, don't sea otters eat urchins as well? Yes, they, that's a primary food uh, that they eat are sea otters. So they will help, definitely help with the situation. As I said earlier, they found where we have urchin barrens, they, the, the sea otters are so nutrient poor because they're basically shriveled up zombies waiting for food to come that otters won't touch them. So, you know, so that's not going to, we need to get the sea stars back, get the whole system in shape. But once we have otters, they will definitely uh, control um, sea urchins. Also getting a lot of praise, Roy. Ryan says, thanks, your efforts at bird conservation are outsized. Linda oh. says, thank you for the excellent presentation. Great, thank you. Thanks for people tuning in. They didn't have to get out on a stormy night. They could just go online, which is great. <laughs> All right, Bill wants to know, was there more kelp before the extinction of sea otters? Did their eradication cause the loss of exposed rocky habitat for kelp? You know, I don't know if we know the direct effects, but there historically was more kelp. And I there were apparently, from what I uh, understand, there was some kelp somewhere off of Reedsport that disappeared. So I, there must be, in at least some area, there must be some hard substrate out there. But um, yeah, I don't know if it was directly, you know, because the otters, the last otter was harvested in Oregon in 1913 or 1916 or something like that. So basically the otters were gone before anybody was even thinking about kelp. So, um, you know, people weren't doing studies then, they were just trying to make a, make a living and, and survive. So we don't really know that, you know, that issue very well. Thank you. Let's see, we have another question from Ingrid. Are there any efforts being made to harvest urchins to sell to Asian and other markets? There was a big uh, urchin harvest uh, that started in the late 80s and it was centered in Port Over, but it occurred all along the coast. And that that uh, fishery was targeting red urchins, really big red urchins that are in a bit deeper water. And a lot of the urchin barrens we have now are the purple urchins, which are much smaller and not com as commercially valuable. And so the, there was a boom fishery. Fishermen were coming from California and we had all sorts of issues to deal with. And then it kind of it drew back to a small fishery. And I think there's still a small fishery, but it, it's not very big. I'll add to that also. Um... In California, and there's some experimental uh, efforts here through Sea Grant, some other programs too. They go out and harvest these urchins that are have very low nutrient value, bring them into an aquaculture facility, and grow the uni, the what's huh. the desired part of the, and make yeah. them marketable commercial crops. So there's there's efforts uh, 
like that as part of an effort, overall effort to re bring kelp back. That's yeah. great to hear. They'll feed them dulse. Um, so Oregon seaweed is involved in that project. Nice. Uh, all right, Nancy wants to know, do you know what water temperature is ideal for kelp? I don't know what the I don't know what the extremes are. I'm trying to think it grows all the way up into Alaska and it uh, grows down to Southern California at least. So that's a pretty good uh, pretty good distribution of temperature, but I don't know for certain myself. And you get into California, you get into another, species of kelp called giant kelp. And that kelp has leaves all the way down the stem. It's really a different different plant. And there actually is a small population of that at uh, Simpson Reef and Coos Bay. It's the only place in Oregon where we have some of that, but. All right, we have more praise. Steve says, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Says, Thanks Roy, I've always, it's always a joy to see your photos. I appreciate the ID clues too. Yeah. And then Ingrid says, gorgeous photos and great information. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from folks? Great. All right, you can also contact Roy with any follow-up questions. I'll drop his email in the chat. So if you think of a question later, feel free to reach out. All right, going once, going twice. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone for your awesome questions. And thank you, Roy, so much for the presentation. That was super informative. That's great. All right. Okay. So. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, of course. I'm going to move on with the rest of the presentation. Okay. So um, as we talked about um, a little bit here, our, our seabirds face all kinds of threats. Um, from plastic pollution, habitat destruction, uh, negative interactions with fishery equipment, um, but also changing ocean and climate conditions are a big one. Um, so you can support their continued survival by respecting nesting birds and closure areas on the beach, preventing your dogs from chasing um, seabirds because that stresses them out, um, not feeding birds or wildlife, and generally just being good stewards of our coasts. I'm sure many of you know that, but I like to, to remind folks um, of that. You can also volunteer with Audubon Society or Oregon Shores through our Coast Watch program um, to help out with community science projects, including bird monitoring. Um, and then also our kelp forests are in crisis, um, as we talked about from the exploding urchin populations, um, over foraging on kelp. And, and then also the thermal stress from climate change is uh, contributing as well. And so to help the kelp, you can support um, some of our partner organizations such as the Oregon Kelp Alliance and the Alaka Alliance who are trying to reintroduce sea otters. Um, and they're working really hard to restore our kelp forests. Uh, you can also vote and support climate policy that aims to reduce fossil fuel dependence and build a more resilient coastline. So those are just some of the ways that you can take action. Um, and then another way you can take action right now is to support ODFW's Marine Reserve Program, which is a network of five marine reserves and nine ma marine protected areas across the coast. And these areas are dedicated to conservation and scientific research. Um, but as Roy discussed today, they also ho host many of our remaining kelp forests and they're really important seabird foraging and nesting areas. Um, and right now there's a house bill under consideration by the state legislature that would expand funding for the Marine Reserve Program. Um, and this would also allow ODFW to enhance monitoring, 
um, create an adaptive management program and um, expand community engagement. And this bill just moved from the Joint Committee on Ways and Means to uh, the House floor uh, beginning next week. I believe it'll be scheduled Tuesday or Wednesday. And so you can take action by contacting your legislators and asking that they vote yes on the bill. Uh, there's also an opportunity to submit written testimony on the state legislature website early next week. So that's another way that you can take action. And then of course you can spread the word uh, about the bill. We really wanna see this get passed. Uh, it'd be a huge win for our coast. So I'm gonna drop some of that information in the chat for folks um, with links to email your legislators. So there's all the information you need right there. And then also um, we are hosting another webinar about marine reserves next week, or sorry, not next week, uh, at the end of March. Um, so the a guest speaker for that webinar will be Dr. Will White, who is an associate professor at OSU. Um, and the topic will be about marine reserves and asking the essential question, um, are marine reserves conservation tools or are they a threat to fisheries? So if you join us um, in a couple of weeks for our, our follow-up um, webinar, you'll get to hear from Dr. Will White. And so here's the registration link in the chat. And then I just want to thank everybody for joining. I really appreciate you joining us on a on a Thursday evening. Um, sounds like it's rainy on the coast. So thank you for getting cozy with us and learning about kelp and birds. And you can learn more about our organizations and sign up for our newsletters um, to stay in the loop about our work by visiting our respective websites. Uh, again, you can also uh, contact Roy if you have any more questions. Both of our organizations also have social media accounts where you can stay connected and learn about opportunities to get involved and to volunteer. And we hope to see everyone at our next Marine Reserve webinar on March 21st. So have a great evening and stay warm, everybody. Thank, Thank you so much, Roy. Yeah, take care. Thank you, Roy. We're wrapping up a little early. Thank you, everyone.